All right, everyone. I'll let everyone get in here a little bit. Oh, I got a couple more coming in. Okay. Then after this, I'm gonna start. Perfect. Got a few seats over on the far room, mm -hmm. or far side of the room, rather. Excellent. Cool. So I am going to get started I'm resetting the shot clock now so I know where I'm at. Um, this is Hiding in Plain Sight, uh, building a remote penetration testing platform. Now, before I introduce myself, I would like to lead us all in the holiest of prayers, the legal disclaimer. Um, this content of this presentation is, represents my thoughts and opinions and is not representative of any of my employers past or current, very legal. Uh, the presentation also deals with matters of penetration testing. Consult legal counsel before engaging in penetration testing activities. That means all you college kids, I mean it seriously. Uh, the build modifies an electrical device dealing with high voltages and proper handling can result in injury or death. I promise you I won't be this monotone all the way through. And the presenter, this guy, uh, takes no liability for damages resulting from the use of the information discussed in this presentation. Now that I've bored you to death with that, here's me. Uh, my name is Ian Meyer. Uh, I'm an information security professional, although after Moses talk, I'm actually really reevaluating that, that name. Um, I have a BS in information system security and AS in computer network systems. I deal with HIPAA, FERPA, for, uh, high, HIPAA high tech, PCI, uh, intrusion detection, uh, social engineering, penetration testing, all the colors of the security rainbow. Uh, I have a Security Plus, SolarWinds certified professional, and as of the third, I passed the CISSP. Now, I only mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I only mention that because if you are going to do a talk uh, and uh, go through and do the CISSP pro tip, don't do that. Uh, do not do that at the same time. If you're going to do that, have an incredibly amazing wife who I'm going to say hi to right now. Hi, Katie. Hopefully you'll see this later. I love you. Um, she's amazing. You tell her that when you see her. <laughs> anyway. So. Uh, also, that photograph, by the way, if you can get a professional photographer, they can make this hot mess look good. So, do that. So, um, where did this idea come from? Um, what, what we're going to talk about is where, where did this idea come from? Device functions and requirements, uh, materials and build, penetration testing capabilities, creating a device that blends in. That's really the key focus of this talk, by the way. Uh, getting alerts when the device is discovered. Uh, a little concept I like to call red team, blue team, purple team. Um, and pre uh, preventing devices like this in your environment, it's nice to play red team all the time, but frankly, we got a lot of defenders in the room, people who get paid to do this, so we got to know how to stop this device too. Uh, next steps for this device and getting more information. So we're going to go through all that uh, to say what Willy Wonka said, I think, how's it go, is uh, so little to do in so much time. So let's, uh, let's get started. So again, where did this idea come from? Everything starts somewhere and this started un under a desk. Um, so anyway, I was at one of my jobs, a uh, standard issue cube farm, and I look under the desk, and what do I see? It's an APC 350 UPS battery backup. And it suddenly dawns on me, I had no idea this was under here. Uh, it's hidden in the cable management arms. It's probably been there since it was bought, maybe months, maybe years, I don't know. And you know what? As a security professional, again, that word, uh, I didn't think anything of it. And that's actually what got me thinking is, wait a minute, if I'm not paying attention to this, what about other people? They're not paying attention to it. I mean, it's probably been there forever. So this isn't an original idea. Uh, you can go online. You can Google penetration testing on the Raspberry Pi. It, it's out there. There's hundreds of people that do it. The fine people at Pony Express have an addition. Uh, there's the Pwn Pi. There's uh, Kali Linux running on, on Raspberry Pi. There's also a book that came out in January, and we're actually going to reference this pretty heavily. Uh, great book uh, by Joseph Munoz and Amir Lakani. I hope I'm saying their names right because they did great work that covers everything. So again, this isn't an original idea, so why am I here talking to you about it? Well, the reason I'm here talking about it is the devices that exist in the market now, um, they're great. I mean, here's the Pwn Pro, right? Incredible device, great product. It's, you know, what, 1200 1800 bucks. Um, the academic edition is 295. Here's the actual device used by the team that wrote the book. Uh, and then up top there, that little wall wart, and it uh, was built by Sammy Kmar. Am I saying that right? Kamkar, forgive me. Um, it detects wireless for keyboards and sends them over 2G. So 
you've got all these devices that you can put in an environment to do varying levels of things, but some are incredibly expensive. Some are, you know, reasonable, but suffer from some plainness. Some would stick out to a security professional. If you saw this thing here hanging on some wires off of your rack, what would you think? Like, what's going on? What's going on here? Um, and then that wall wart, eh, you know, it, it's really cool and it's 20 bucks, but it only really does one thing. So here's the problem. If all these things suffer from either plainness or they, they, they stick out in an environment or, and when I say plainness, I mean they're so generic that it triggers you to think about something like, why is this thing here? It doesn't look like anything that should be in my environment and I've never seen it before. So that brings me to the concept of the uncanny valley. So we're going to go a little off the IT track for a minute. So the uncanny valley is a hypothesis in which, uh, in the field of aesthetics, that when things just don't look or move quite right, they set off, and the theory is revulsion. You look at it and go, what is this? Why is it in here? And it just doesn't look right. So this is actually an animatronic robot out of Japan. Um, I, I don't know whose it is. Uh, it's in the photo credits. But it doesn't look quite right. It sticks out. You look at it and go, that's not human. Um, then there's the book, The Gift of Fear. Intuition is always right in at least two ways. It's a response to something, and it has your best interest in heart. So what happens when you combine these two ideas? You get an emotional response to something in your environment telling you, this is not right. Something is not right here, and I need to investigate it. Which brings us to kind of the point of this talk. How many of you have seen a room like this? How many of you have rooms like this? <laughs> okay. So, <that's laughs> um, so yeah. So this is a standard wiring closet in a lot of small businesses, a lot of big businesses too. So some of these devices might stick out in there. But what about that? What about a UPS? Would that stick out in the environment? I don't think so. So what if we took a device like that and embedded a penetration platform into it? and hid it in plain sight. So hiding the device isn't difficult. It's, it's large, but again, it's, you know, it doesn't stick out in an environment. It's something that people are used to seeing. So let, let me move on. Uh, the device functions and requirements. Let's actually get into what this thing does, how to build it, this, that, and the other. So uh, things we won't talk about today. Uh, we're not going to talk about the software build. Um, I could spend probably two hours talking about the software build. It's not incredibly complex, but it, you know, it takes some time. Uh, software configuration, again, we're not going to talk about that because it takes a lot of time. What we, aren't also, what we also aren't going to talk about is the levels of activity, what color your hat is. This is going to focus on white hat activities. We're not talking about black hat. We're not talking about going into an environment and totally pwning them. Um, you want to make sure if you're using this device or you're ever involved in a penetration test, always have written authorization. you got to have the get out of jail free card. Verify the signer has the rights to give you that authorization. Somebody can just say, hey, yeah, no, go ahead, hack my network, it's totally cool. Um, and then validate the systems are in scope for that test. So if we're not talking about any of that stuff, what do you say we're going to do here today? Um, we're going to talk about building the device that hides in plain sight. We're going to talk about some of the design challenges and features of, of building a device like this. We're going to talk about the cellular hardware and the Wi-Fi hardware, uh, network bridge, modular configuration, I'm just reading from bullet points, uh, proper weight, power LED, power on all USB devices, phoning home, monitoring over cellular, and passive alerts and soft auditing. By the way, that's my favorite part uh, when we get to this. So tools will change. They're going to they're gonna change. I wanted to build a platform that when the Raspberry Pi 2 comes out, when some of the new Intel computer on a stick comes out, I wanted to build a platform that you could take these things, shove them in, and augment your capabilities for all the, either penetration testing or any other capability that you need for auditing InfoSec. So you heard me mention that we're not going to talk about a lot of this stuff. That doesn't mean I'm not going to get you the information. Don't worry. You're all a fine group of people. We're going to get that for you. So the first bit of that is this. Um, this document's available on my website right now. I actually posted it right before I got up here, so it's there. Um, it's about a 55-page build guide with all the photos of how, what, breaking down the device, putting in the materials, et cetera. And uh, it has an inventory of the devices 
and things that you need to buy. The other book, as I mentioned, the other book, as I mentioned, is Raspberry uh, Penetration Testing with a Raspberry Pi. Go buy this book. It's $10 for Kindle download. It's not incredibly expensive. It supports the community and literally tells you everything you need to do on the software side. Gives you some attack scenarios, gives you some of the challenges you're going to hit, such as make sure you update your Kali software. Trust me on this. Um, so it's going to cover some of that for you. So these two items will give you all the additional information that I'm not going to cover here today. So the materials and build. Do you want to build a snow? I've never seen Frozen. I just used that quote because I thought it was funny. Um, here's a problem. I'm a filthy, dirty liar. I promised you a $200 platform in the abstract. It was $203. Um, so, you know, sorry about that. But here's the good news. Uh, all the items that are italicized, if you're in the IT field, if you're a tinker, a maker, etc., you probably got a lot of this stuff lying around. The ones that are in bold, you're going to want to buy. And I've actually put in more detail with the links to where I source the items in the document. But you're going to want to make sure you've got the right chipsets. If you've worked in Linux, you want to make sure you've got the support for it. You're going to want to make sure you've got 3G modems, 4G modems that are supported by the operating system. So make sure if you're using this, that you're buying the right parts, you're getting the right chipsets. The rest of it, you can salvage up to and including the case. Um, I actually paid 15 bucks for the case at Skycraft, but you, you might have one in a junk pile somewhere. So. So the other thing that I was really interested in doing here, and going back to those discussions at the top of the, the different devices that are out there and the, the Raspberry Pi just hanging off a rack, I wanted to build something that was very solid, that somebody would look at it in the environment, even if they picked it up and kind of shook it, it wasn't going to be like a, a bag of bolts just rattling around. So uh, in the process of doing this, I decided to try on another skill, which is 3D printing. Um, I've designed four parts that help facilitate this project. Um, you can reuse these. These are already up online, the SDL files and the object files. If you're into 3D printing and you want to use them, modify them for your project, please take. Um, the number one over there is what I call the Raspberry Pi platform. And by the way, can everyone hear me? Am I good? Are we good? Good? OK. Um, excellent. Uh, it's the Raspberry Pi platform. It's a riser board that allows you to connect I can uh, I can talk louder. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not mic'd. Yeah, oh, okay. I, I can I can grab a mic if it, you need you need the mic. Is that better? Okay, I can do that. Okay. Oh yeah, no no problem. I can grab a mic. I will not drop the mic. I will try not to drop. Um, so it's the Raspberry Pi platform, and basically this is a 3D printed part that's going to allow you to mount a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is a B plus that I use, but I believe the, the two that's coming out will also mount directly to it. It's also going to allow you to strap those devices on. Originally, I tried to over-engineer this. I'm like, I'm going to make a perfect holder that holds exactly the network card. It's, gonna be, it's just going to be so perfect. And then I realized, eh, that's really not going to work, because you might later on go to build this and want to use a different network card, or a different modem, or a different AC adapter. So what I did was I put a lot of holes in there to mount zip ties. Uh, Velcro, you know, this other, you kind of see that down at the bottom there. The other one is the antenna. This was one of the build challenges. This is a metal box. I got to put antennas in it. So, uh, what I found was on the front of the bezel plastics that there was a gap, enough of a gap that I could put the cellular modem and the Wi Fi antenna. So now it's outside of that metal box and I get a little better signal. There's still some data string things that we'll talk about, but again, it allows you to put those tools outside of there. Um, the third item there, like I said, is uh, related to the cell phone, uh, the sub 3G modem. But um, I also designed that under engineering it. I put a lot of holes in there, a lot of mounts, so you put zip ties on there. I didn't want to limit you to say, oh, how do I put this thing on? It doesn't fit. Uh, it's just some straps that you can put on there that easily connect to the device, keep it solid. You pick it up, you shake it, nothing's coming loose. You ship it to the client, it's good to go. My favorite part, though, was my first part um, it's the network bypass. So, yes? I prefer the way that you kill the lights right here, the glare off of the fluorescent. I don't know. See a lot of the details. Sorry about that. Thanks a lot. Okay. Everyone grab a partner. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I 
Excellent. Okay. So the network coupler. Um, this is the part that really, really had to work because it's the only one that's going to be exposed to them. I'm trying to get a use of this mic. Uh, I'm trying to, it's the only one that's going to be exposed to the user. So they're going to see this on the outside. We may plug it, network cables into it so that we can go through and do man in the middle attacks, etc. So it had to work very well. It had to be very solid and connected to the case. So we used some, uh, some couplers purchased off of Amazon, put them into the 3D printed part, and uh, off it goes. Cool. So, um, yeah, uh, this is another big legal warning. Um, if you don't know about electricity, be very careful with this. <laughs> You're going to be rewiring high voltage. Uh, it's 120 volts. Uh, you can see that kid's probably not going to college. Um, but uh, this is going to, A, avoid your warranty. Um, it's going to, <laughs> let me take a step back. The reason this is important is this device needs to create permanence. And we're going to talk about that in a slide in a second. Permanence is created by the device operating the way it normally would. So we want those outlets on the back to work because we want to plug stuff into them. We want somebody to walk up, look at this thing, and go, ah, it's plugged in. Do you know, Steve, do you know, do you know, do you know this, no? I'll leave it plugged in, we'll look at it later. That's what you want. So, just a quick warning though, this voids the warranty, uses 110 volt, test your wiring before connecting. There's a great tester you can get if you're familiar with Harbor Freight, I love them. Um, you can get a tester for a couple bucks. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, please do not do this. Consult electrician, the big warning at the bottom, it can result in a permanent case of death. Um, so, you've been warned. So what do we end up with once the build is done? Some of the folks down in the splash zone up here, the device is actually down here if you haven't seen, I'll leave it out to take a look at it. But um, this is what you end up with. You end up with a UPS that has a Raspberry Pi in it, that's got all your attack penetration platform in it. Uh, that's got a network bypass leading off the back so you can do your man in the middle attacks if that's what's required for your evaluation. Uh, you've got a transformer left in there. Now the transformer's not used, why don't I put it back in? I mean, it's just taking up space, right? Who said, wait, bingo, wait. So what's the quote from Jurassic Park when the kid picks up the binoculars and the lawyer's like, are they heavy? Yeah, then put it down, they're expensive. Um, that's, that's the kind of reaction you want out of people. They find the device, they go to pick it up, and they go, oh, no, no, I don't want to touch this. It's not good. So uh, the thing is, kind of, it's kind of heavy. Um, now, uh, in the end, sooner or later, we'll get a battery back into it, which will really you know, give it that firm weight. But uh, that was one of the design challenges for the wave. We, all, we already talked about the bezel and the bezel plastics, making sure the antennas are up there. But that was also very important because you know, put inside that metal box. And so I'm sure I covered all this. And we covered the network bypass. That was also very important for the build to make sure that you got all the capabilities that you're going to want in an attack platform. Stickers! Uh, who doesn't love stickers, huh? Stickers? Everyone loves stickers? Stickers. Um, there are a few of these stickers up here. The folks that came early got first dibs, but please take them. Um, I love warning stickers for this kind of stuff. They're great. They're deterrents. People look at them, and if they don't know what they are, they go, eh, no, no, that's got power in it. Mm, it might shock me. I don't like it. So they don't touch it. So you want to do something like that where you're trying to deter the people, the ones that are just curious enough. You want them to get close and go, no, nah, not today. Um, we also have asset tags. When I said the network coupler is my favorite part, it wasn't. Um, the, the asset tag is my favorite part. We actually have a couple slides on that. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, the other thing I want to point out about the asset tags is you'll, you'll see them in a little better detail in a moment. But I put them towards the back of the box. And that's also very important when you're trying to hide this in plain sight. So we'll talk about that as well. Let's see. Just making sure I'm good on time here. So here it is, all assembled, ready to go. Um, the back looks like a normal UPS. The power outlets work. The network bypass works. The uh, online light glows when the Raspberry Pi is on. So if the Pi is on, people walk by, it looks, for all intents and purposes, like a, just a device they see every day. And that's really the point. So um, let's dive in here. So penetration testing capabilities. I think it's actually legally required that I have a quote from hackers. So. We have one, so check that off. Um, what can it do? So we've got this cool device, and what can it do? Short answer, lots. I mean, it can do a ton of stuff. Um, it's, it's Kali Linux. It's all the tools that are Kali Linux. 
Um, anything that you're looking to do, they're all listed up there, I'll try not to read through the bullet points, but anything that you're looking to do on a pen test, it can do. You can scope it to do, to do specific types of attacks. You don't want to use the network bypass, fine. Run a loop back through so it just loops it through. That's fine. You know, if you want to do uh, packet sniffing, you want to do Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi penetration, also good. What can't it do? That's the real problem. So in the end, it can't do much at the same time. So you want to be very specific about what you're choosing to attack. You're not going to go in here and run full-blown vulnerability analysis. You're not going to be brute forcing passwords at the same time. It's just not possible. You're still talking about a $35 computer. <laughs> That's really what you're talking about here. Now we're making a lot of big advances in how powerful these things are getting. I mean, just the Pi 2 is already making a huge leap up in, in power and what it's capable of running. So that might change. But for right now, this is kind of the, the boat you're in. So what do I recommend for this? You know, what, where, does this where is this really powerful? And I kind of put it at the bottom of the footprint. Um, I can't do that on the footprint, 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 pivot, pivot, pivot. Um, what is it really good for is it, it mapping the network. Getting in there, finding out what's there, finding a foothold, and pivoting. And again, uh, I'll say it again because I like to say it, in an authorized pen testing exercise. Okay, good. We did that. So, creating a device that blends in. Don't find the man behind the curtain. I know we're at a college and that's Wizard of Oz. There's some people that probably still get it. But, um, so, <laughs> you, tell, you tell who's like 30 and older and the little chuckles in the background. All right, so um, how do we create a device that blends in? Really, I kind of, as I was thinking about it, I broke it down into four tenets. Permanence, belonging, authenticity, and chaff. Um, actually, one of my coworkers, as I was doing this the first time, uh, I mentioned, I'll start with chaff, because he uh, pointed out, I'm like, yeah, chaff, you know, if you're used to, you know, military person, you know, fire off the chaff, and the, uh, the heat-seeking missiles follow it, and he's like, they're not enough chaff, it's for radio, radar, it's flares, for not that thing. Um, so anyway, so chaff, let's start there. Um, you want to have someone who finds this device, you don't want them to just go off on their own and try to figure out what it is. Pick it apart, unplug it, etc. So you want to put something there to direct them. Channel that creative curiosity. Um, you do that a lot of times with these stickers I've talked about. We're going to look at them uh, in just a moment. So you want to create something that drives the user to do what you want them to do, which is leave that device alone and give you more information. You want to create permanence. We talked about permanence as well. Um, the, the power outlets on there, you create permanence by plugging things into them. People look at it and go, this device has been plugged in, it's been there forever, maybe I didn't notice it, but it's obviously on, it's got a light on, things are running off of it, don't touch it, it's the weekend and it's five o'clock, leave it there. And that happens, I think we all know that happens. You know, you know I'm just not gonna borrow trouble, I'm just gonna go home and I think they'll be fine. Um, so you wanna make, make that happen. Um, you need belonging. Don't put in a beige UPS if your target has got, I mean, if you can find a beige UPS, uh, but don't put in a beige UPS if your target's all using AAA or APC or this, that, and the other, modern, it's gonna stick out. It's a UPS, sure, but get an idea of the environment. If it's an all, you know, major, if, if they use all products from one major vendor versus another, certainly don't drop one of their competitors in. It's gonna look weird. So, you know, you wanna deal with belonging. It's gotta look like it belongs there. Oh, I'm sorry, the permanence. Um, which one? I don't know. I don't know. So, and then authenticity. It's got to look real. We talked about this at the, at the beginning. Um, generic devices. Generic devices are just as bad as, as a device that doesn't look like, or looks, you know, uh, like something outside of the environment. So it's got to be authentic. It's got to look like a real device, something that person's used to seeing. So here's our stickers and our lights. Notice the stickers are on the back. So why did I do that? Why is that important? If this thing's tucked under a desk, most people are gonna walk by it. They're just gonna look at it and they're gonna go, mm, okay, fine, whatever, no problem. But then there's people like this in the room or people that wanna be like this in the room or maybe you're in college right now and you're like, oh, I found something, let me go check it out. And you're real excited to go help the team there discover this thing in your environment. And you find these, these stickers on the back and you get your first set of people that are gonna see the danger stored energy on the back, they're gonna get just close enough to it, and they're gonna go, not today, maybe I'll have somebody else here, boys. Um, and then you're gonna have the second group of people, which is my favorite group of people, um, that are gonna look at the asset tag. And what I did was uh, I, I got these wonderful 
Avery Dura label things or asset tag labels you know on Amazon. And they've got a wonderful website with a wonderful tool that helps you create these, these labels for free. And I created a fake company called Red Prox, solving problems for the future. Um, and I put it on the side and I'm towards the back and you get that second type of person that goes, oh, I found this thing and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna call that number and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up the website, I'm gonna find out what it is, I'm gonna tell my InfoSec guys or I'm gonna tell the corporate security people or whoever it is, they're gonna report this to. But hopefully, they're gonna go through what we're gonna see on the next, uh, uh, next couple slides first. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about on, on this device is dings and dents. I really like using salvage stuff. Again, new stuff, if your environment hasn't bought anything, if you're in some environment that's got your inventory and your budget on lockdown and no one's seen a new computer since 1996, a brand new UPS is gonna stick out like a sore thumb. It's not gonna hide in plain sight. So uh, we want something with dings and dents, maybe a little dust in it, leave it out in your garage. You know, so it looks and it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's been there forever. You want that, you absolutely want that. Sure I've covered everything here. Cover the labels. Very good. Electro. Good. Good. Who's seen Die Hard movies? Who likes Die Hard movies? They're great. They're action movies. Fantastic. Um, so this is Die Hard with a Vengeance. One of my favorite Die Hards. And what is this scene? This is the scene where they find the bomb in the school, and it's in a refrigerator that was delivered today, and had a power light on it, and had a temperature turned on, but wasn't plugged in. And that's how they discovered it, right? They look and they're like, hey, all these refrigerators came and see how they're all on? But it's not plugged in, here's our bomb. Same thing, so that's why the power light was really important to me and took way longer than I really wanted to do, soldering and cleaning and figuring out how to document it. And it seems easy until you start doing it. Um, so I really wanted that though, I wanted that light to be there because again, it adds to that permanence and that authenticity. The person looks at it and goes, that thing's on, it's performing as designed, it's there for a reason, and I'm not gonna touch it. So let's talk about where to hide this thing. Where do we hide it? I mean, we built a device that can then essentially hide right in front of your face in an IT environment, but where do you hide it? Well, there's two places I like. We, we saw the, the network cable room with all the cables floating everywhere. Excellent place to hide it. Um, we see some, some data center rooms here. Um, you'll actually notice if you're paying particularly close attention, there's one right there. There's one of the APC devices right below that CRT. So that's obviously an older picture, they have an upgrade, but who knows. Uh, but that was found on Google, and I just went around looking, and I was like, oh, there's one, just sitting there. No one's gonna pay any attention to it, especially if it's a MDF or IDF that people rarely go into, and you get access to it as part of an approved penetration testing exercise. <laughs> I actually like the mic now, I'm glad I picked it up. Thank you. Um, so uh, that said, so hiding under a desk is fine, under a file cabinet. Again, we've designed this so that it just sits there. It doesn't, it doesn't look like anything. Jeez, it's the information security team. So how do we alert when this device is discovered? Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, the book that I talked about before, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail as to how we do this, but again, you're gonna need to set up like a reverse shell or S tunnel, tunnel. I've actually never heard someone say it aloud. I've only read it, so it could be either. Um, but you're going to want to set up something that's phoning back home. Um, the recommendation is this S tunnel tool because if you've got an IDS IPS uh, at the approved penetration testing site, uh, if you've got that, then they might see SSH and they might have this blocked. 443 outbound, you're going to have a lot more luck with that. So the other thing you can do is a VPN tunnel. Uh, that has a lot of overhead. We talked about the problems with that. You're still dealing with a $35 device, so you're gonna put a lot of overhead on that VPN. And basically, how do you alert for what's been caught? Well, you monitor the tunnels. If it goes down, if it's not there, if you can't reach it, it's down. Someone's unplugged it. They've powered it down, and, and you know that the jig is officially up. But wait, there's more. So here's Red Prox. I'm literally, I'm doing a talk on this because I had way too much fun building it. Red Prox is a Google site. Red Prox is a fake company using a you know, Web 2.0 logo maker and uh, it has a bunch of Easter eggs in it and it's literally a website that says everything and nothing all at once. Um, they deal with uh, Cubes, which is quantifiable object-oriented business strategy and Cubile Dynamics, offering solutions for the future. And this site, uh, you'll notice one of the other Easter eggs is from a movie called uh, uh, Unfinished Business. I think it's out right now, I don't know, I'm not trying to promote it, but they did a, a promotion 
where they gave out a bunch of fake stock photos making fun of the business world. That's James Franco's brother up there. So if, if someone's really paying they're like, oh, wow, I guess before he did acting, he did like, okay, all right, all right, okay, sure. So the site has a products and services page and about us page and the, the location on Google Maps is the downtown Orlando library. Uh, I was like four, four, I had four Privet Drive for the Harry Potter fans. And, and you know, just a bunch of stuff like that. And I had way, way, way too much fun doing it. As I'm doing it, I'm reading my wife all the little like insider business jokes that I've written. She's like, if I could divorce you right now, I would do that. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> so, um, so this is Red Rocks. And that's where that asset tag points you. You get sent to this website. Um, and, uh, and you get a form, a beautiful, beautiful form. You know, see, it's the found asset form, and it gives you a warning at the top, please don't power down the device. This is part of a, uh, a business dynamics test, and contact us, and we'll reach out to your Red Prox target partner. Target partner. So, um, they submit the form, and I get this wonderful, wonderful back end from Google. Thank you, Google. Uh, with a spreadsheet, with all the wonderful info they're going to give me, and you know what's even better than that? Now they expect me to call them. I've already set them up to be warm and fuzzy, like, oh, you found one of our devices, how wonderful, thank you for identifying it. Tell me more. So, I, I, I can I click on this from here? I hope so. So, I, I, I again, my, my wife heard me recording this, and she was like, no, seriously, I'm going to divorce you. Um, so, I, I made a Google Voice a voicemail for Red Prox. Um, and uh, I want people to call it. I want them to get very frustrated and give me more information. Just like, oh, stupid IVR doesn't work. So we're going to try and play that now. Um, it's 35 seconds. I hope you get a kick out of it. Let's see if we can do this. Thank you for calling Red Prox, the leader in quantifiable object oriented business strategy. Experience the Cube's difference. Press or say one to speak with a Cube's professional. Press or say two if you've located one of our cube's assets. Press or say three to speak with... I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. Press one to speak... I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. Transferring to the operator. And that takes them just directly to a voice phone. So... And a red team member will contact you shortly. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the red box difference. Um, and like I said, this is all about hiding this device in plain sight and 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 making sure that we get the most out of it. Because penetration testing is awesome, but the people are also a target. So let's talk about that a little bit. Red team, blue team, purple team. I tried to make this like red fish, blue fish, but I couldn't figure that out, so I didn't. Um, so what what is that? So. A lot of you in here, you're in college, maybe you're trying to get into information security, maybe this is your first conference. You've got red team, blue team exercises. It's so pretty standard. You know, uh, your red team's your attack, they're your offense, penetration testing, exposed asset discovery, all the really cool stuff that they show on CSI Cyber and all those great shows. Um, and then you've got blue team, which is the boring drudgery work. And it's fantastic and it's awesome and it's needed and it's a field I work in. Um, and, uh, and we do a very good job, BJ, um, uh, so, uh, we do a very good job. So, um, but it's blue team, it's, we have to defend these environments, we're paid, uh, to do that. Um, but here's the thing, um, it's going to be very rare that you get to go out as a information security, um, professional, as an expert, as a, as a, you know, discipline, um, I really liked Moses' talk this morning. Um, it's going to be very rare that you get to dedicate yourself to one exercise or the other. So you kind of end up as a purple team. There's only so many hours in the day that you have to attack all these different vulnerabilities and issues in the environment. Um, so you really have to try and figure out what you're going to want to do. What, what, what do you prioritize? And you become that Iron Man. You say, all right, I've got, to, I've got to defend, I've got to test, I've got to figure out all the vulnerabilities, I've got to figure out our, our footprint and what can be attacked. So you're not likely not going to get to do the type of all or nothing type of research. So this device, and the reason I, I talk about it, is with the Red Crocs piece, with the stickers on the back, with the penetration testing, with the hiding in plain sight, you're not just testing your network. You're testing your people. You're testing your policy. You're testing 
how people respond to rogue devices in your environment. If they find something, do they call the InfoSec team? Do they call a desktop? Do they put in a ticket? Do they, do they follow a known training policy? Have they been trained? Are they performing as normal humans and they just haven't been told the right thing to do? So you can use this to not just test the environment, but you can use it as a, as a physical token in the real world for people to react to. Do they call the red box phone number? Do they, do they leave a message? What do they tell you? you know, so how can you pivot further from that by triggering that information? So preventing this device. Uh, we don't take kindly to rogue devices in our home net. So what are we gonna do, right? We're blue team folks. How do we stop this thing? How do we keep it out of our environment? Because it's nasty and it's ugly and I built it, I know that. Um, so what are the first two controls, critical controls from SANS? Inventory and oh, by the way, inventory. You have to know what's in your environment. You have to, or you've got no shot. You have to know what's there, what's functioning, what it's doing, what is it supposed to be doing, what are the goals for it, how are people using it. Know what's there, because when you know what's there, it's easier to detect the anomalies. This doesn't hide as well if someone goes, uh, we don't issue UPSs for people at desks. We have a centralized UPS for our entire power environment. Why is that there? If you know that, if you have a policy, and you know that there should be none of these devices in the inventory, it becomes significantly easier to detect. So, isolation, you gotta keep them separated. Again, going back for the people older than 30. Um, <laughs> air gapping. Notice I have it in quotes. Um, I had a really great conversation with my coworkers the other day about air gapping, um, and in which I really honestly learned something. Um, and it's, it's that air gapping gets thrown around. It's a term that people go, oh, it's air gapped, it's found, you can't get into it. And it's not, it's not. I mean, eventually these devices go to the internet. You got internet of things, you got this, you got that. Everyone has to put the device to the internet for reporting and this and that and whatnot. Put it in the cloud and whatever. You need to know, again, your inventory, where things live, and you need to know how to separate them so that when they're communicating with each other, such as this device, communicating with every server in your environment, you go, in and, oh, hold on, no, that network should never talk to that network, ever. So let's go hunt this thing down, let's find the port on the switch, let's find out what's going on. Access control is the next piece, whitelisting authentication digital certificates. Um, actually, I skipped over NAC, but um, I'll kind of lump it in. So um, NAC, NAC as well. Go through, keep devices off your network. Obviously, there are ways around these types of things, and I won't go into them. But I will say, uh, if your, I don't know, multifunction printer is suddenly running Nmap, um, <laughs> might not be a multifunction printer. Just gonna throw that out there. So uh, you know, make sure that you're really examining what you whitelist. You know, what what you tell your NAC this is okay. You know, make sure you really take a look at that. Um, Access control, like I said, authentication, whitelisting, you know, make sure the people joining your network are, give them, give them a digital certificate, make every device have to support that. I know that sounds daunting, but I mean, it's really gonna be necessary in the future to do that sort of identification. I can tell you right now, if you've got a PKI environment and you've got to authenticate with a certificate, that device is gonna do nothing. It's not gonna be able to connect to the network. It's not gonna get the, the connection needs. And of course, the most crucial item always is user awareness. If you do not teach the users in your environment about what's going on, about uh, the environment, about what they should expect, about who to contact, I mean, that's the biggest thing. Teach your users, you see something, you say something. I know it sounds silly, it's like McGruff and take a bite out of crime, but seriously, teach them to say something and to the right people. Say, hey, listen, you got a question, send it to us, email us, whatever it is, We'll help you figure it out. We'll track it down. We know what to look for uh, to say, hey, this is a real threat in our environment. So next steps and issues. So in, in building this, you know, what did, what did we learn? What did we find out? So issues beyond the build, cellular strength and data. Um, I use the Huawei 3G modem inside there for cellular. Um, I don't know that I'd recommend it for a professional penetration testing. And the reason I say that is it's just not, even running command line, it's, it's more theoretical than anything. If you're gonna do this professionally, make sure that you're getting the right data strength, right signal strength, invest in a 4G modem, but you can do it. You can absolutely do it. 
Um, battery backup functions. Um, as I'm building it, I'm like, well, this is salvaged. The, the circuit board on it doesn't work anyway. But the next one, I realized there's enough room to pack this in with the battery. Um, and what would be very neat is to be able to know when it's been unplugged and running off the battery, and it's all very possible, and packing that battery back in with the devices. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to try and pack it into a, a forgive me. Um, yeah, battery backup functions and additional USB uh, or multi-pod. Um, the power requirements coming in there, although you've got a five volt uh, wall wart. Um, my timer's off, sorry about that. Okay, um, that's it. Um, so uh, that's it. Um, that wall wart only puts out so much power. You can only pack so many USB devices into that. So you want to make sure that uh, you're, you're scoping out your environment, you're putting in the tools that you're going to need for that test. I say packing in additional USB power or powered USB, uh, but that has additional challenges. Uh, you may have issues with throughput, you may have issues with it being a cheap device from who knows where, so you're going to want to test it. Uh, it's 10100 for the bypass as well. Uh, there's going to be no gig there, so if you're dealing in a gig environment, know that. If they see a slowdown to 100, 100 meg, they're going to go, why'd that link just drop down? You need to have a powered tap to get up to gig, so we're going to look at that. PCAP storage, if you're doing uh, Wireshark or something like that, um, it's only a 16 gig card, you can't just leave it on forever. Um, there may be ways around that challenge, I haven't put a lot of thought into it yet. Uh, smaller battery backup unit are the next steps, I'd like to get into a smaller form factor, still hiding in plain sight. Powered from DC, we want to do that. And uh, Bluetooth, uh, logging, jacking, snarfing, all those fun toys. There's still one available USB port on there, but um, I just didn't get to testing that. And of course, the Raspberry Pi too. So, getting more information. Is this deck going to be available online? Well, I've got good news from some of you already looked. It is already online. Um, so you can go to this link. Um, everything I talked about is already up there. The slide deck, the PDF with notes, SDL, SDL files for all the 3D printed objects, detailed build guide in PDF, so that's all up there. Um, the Avery asset label, and then all the red box images if you want to edit them in GIMP. So that's it. That's the talk. Um, questions? Over there, yes. Uh, yeah, the use of the Zyway modem. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if you've taken apart a lot of their devices. No. But it looks, makes Lenovo look like a walk in the park. <laughs> um, they do this other thing. Watching my marital activities? Hey, okay. grandma and grandpa know the hottest thing on Hong Kong TV. No, I didn't um, even know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Right, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Zyway devices in general, if you monitor for 24 hours with water sharks, you're going to find out a lot of interesting. Uh, cool, no, it's cool. Things. Yeah, don't buy anything Zyway, bottom line. Right. So that's what you, that, and you kind of heard me touch on that. Is I don't know that I'm incredibly happy with that modem, but it's the one that I tested. So. Um, second thing? Yeah. Excuse me? The six cycle yeah, there's there's a wall wart inside of there. Yeah. Um, can you transmit out on that? That is a really cool idea. No, it's not. What do you mean, no, it's not? <laughs> if, Why is it not? If you're not protecting for it. Oh, well, yeah, no, but I mean, like, actually doing it as part of penetration would be kind of cool. Oh, yeah, if your internal uh, chances are you pretty much get away with it. Yeah. And it's a large network, it's very well connected by media. Yeah. That is, yeah, Ethernet over power. Yeah. yeah, right? That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, very cool. No, I'll have to think about that. Um, I have not put any thought into it, but very cool idea. Um, any other questions? Sir? Do you use, uh, did you look at the, using a hot plug uh, so you actually plug devices into it? Oh, you mean, what do you mean? Uh, essentially, a, uh, like a working uh, voltage. Yeah, no, these are powered. No, I mean, so, I mean, you're sticking that in a closet, but uh, if you're going to want to plug some, Yes. So you actually, um, I still have a couple minutes, right? No? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so you, I did. I actually skipped over. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, one of the things I meant to mention was uh, when installing this, one of the things you want to look out for is dual PDU servers. Um, so going through and finding a server that's got dual PDUs, and you, again, you want to make sure you're approved to do these kind of activities because you could knock something offline. But all things being equal, you could unplug one PDU, plug it in, the primary PDU stays online, the secondary alternate, whatever, and then you plug in the secondary one, and oh no, that's totally plugged into our finance server. 
or if you just do one line, so they go, yeah, no, we did it as the secondary PDU on the battery. The only thing you really gotta worry about there is that the PDUs are monitored. Somebody in the knock might go, hey, why'd that PDU go? Oh, it's back up. And that's probably all that would happen. So, did that answer your question? Sure. Cool, okay. Sir? It looks like there's a fair amount of empty space in the, uh, it's in the casing. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you keep the functionality of the UPS intact and then just you know, put an additional converter off of the lead for the UPS? You wanna know the real reason? that UPS is broken. <laughs> it doesn't work. So instead of going out and buying another one, I didn't. So in part of the phase two, what I want to do is, is get one that's functioning. And then, yeah, absolutely. There's a ton of extra room in there. Put a battery in there and actually, um, instead of wiring the, uh, the pie off of there, wiring it directly into the receptacle. So it's basically another wire off the back. But yeah, absolutely all possible. And I'm actually thinking in that multi-pie setup that I'm talking about, maybe even putting like two pies in there. So you have one using the processing power for Wi-Fi, literally network them together and have one as kind of a command and control server. So definitely possible. Yes? So obviously, have you tried any other devices like cameras, microphones, or anything like that? Not yet. No, no. Uh, really, the focus of this build was to try and, again, like so I keep saying it like I'm a branding professional, but it was hiding the device in there. Uh, the capabilities are basically endless. Um, I put the guide up there. I put all the stuff on there. I highly encourage you, if you like it, build it. Let me know how it works out. You know, I'm going to keep playing with this, uh, make it a little better, tweaking it. So if you find something that works particularly well, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear about it. Sir? Do you realize that we now have about 400 people who, for the rest of their careers, can be looking three times <laughs> Then I have done my job. I've done my job. Cool. Um, I think anyone else? No, no. Then I am going to wrap up then. Oh. What's that? Oh, previous slide? Well, that will actually, I'll do you one better. The next slide is a QC. So if you want to just hit that with the phone, um, it'll take you right to the, the thing. So, or I can give you the, the thing. So, anyway, all thank you. Thank you, B Thank you, all the volunteers. It was fantastic.